Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the March 2022 quiz. It's hard to believe it's March already. Where is this winter going? Anyway, we have 10 great cases for you, and without further ado, let's get started. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, I think the thing about this case is, look how many lesions you can see. You see pleural effusions and looks like pleural implants in the left chest. You see multiple liver lesions. You see implants on the image on your right in the subcutaneous tissue. There are also lesions in the patient's small bowel, looks like it's jejunum. There's periodic adenopathy. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a, a disease which involves multiple organ and organ systems. And so what do I think of? Well, the things I think about the most are lymphoma and melanoma. Neuroendocrine tumors can metastasize to multiple areas, not quite as extensive, but typically they're going to be hypervascular. Neurofibromatosis gives you skin lesions, uh, neurofibromas many places, but not this appearance. So we're talking about lymphoma versus melanoma, two good possibilities. With the lesions in the subcutaneous tissues, again, lymphoma or melanoma can be good. I will admit when I see so many organs involved, particularly that small bowel, as well as muscle, subcutaneous tissues, and liver, I'm going to go with melanoma. Obviously, it could be lymphoma, so I'd give you half credit, but melanoma is the best answer. The most likely diagnosis in this patient with weight loss is... Well, if we look at the uh, images, we see an enlarged spleen with multiple low-density lesions in the spleen. We also see periodic adenopathy, best seen by the aortic cable space. We also see subcural nodes. So we're dealing with some process that involves the lymph nodes, involves the spleen, and there's some questionable findings perhaps in the liver. Well, what can I think about? I guess I could think about melanoma, but only splenic involvement with a large spleen, that suggests more something infiltrative, so I don't think about melanoma. TB can give you splenic lesions, that is true. The spleen may or may not be large, so I would consider that. Sarcoid can give you focal splenic lesions and enlarged spleen. Most of the time you'll also see liver involvement as well. Also the subcural nodes are worrying for me to something like malignancy. So. Again, lymphoma probably is the best bet. Big spleen, low density infiltration, you got to be thinking about lymphoma. Very nice example of the subcural nodes, periodic nodes, peripancreatic nodes. The most likely diagnosis in this case will be lymphoma. The incidental adrenal mass was detected and is least likely. Well, so what do I see? I see a large, complex, solid, and cystic lesion in the left adrenal gland. My best bet would be, oh, maybe a cystic pheo, perhaps, but it's not very vascular, but this is not a really a great injection. A primary adrenal cortical carcinoma, that's a good possibility. A prior bleed, cystic, low density, if you had an adenoma that bled, or some other lesion even emit that bled, that would not be bad. The least likely thing to me is an adenoma. Adenomas are smaller, though we do see adenomas, but I don't see adenomas as a complex cystic lesion. So for me, the least likely diagnosis in this case would have been an adrenal adenoma. The least likely diagnosis in this incidental pancreatic mass is, well, what do I see? I see a mass at the body tail junction. It's kind of cystic with the rim. The gland distally looks atrophic. Kind of a not, not a bad place for IPMNs, but when you see IPMNs, you usually see a dilated pancreatic duct. Okay, MCNs, not a bad location. In fact, a great location for an MCN. You sometimes have gland atrophy, but a cystic lesion in the body of the pancreas, body tail junction, I'm thinking MCN always. It could be a cirrhosis adenoma, that's a possibility almost like an oligocystic. The one thing this really doesn't look like is a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Now I have to admit, this is a tough case trying to figure out what exactly it was. And in fact, at the end of the day, it was a mucinocystic neoplasm, but it's not an adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is obstructed duct, though you can get ductal atrophy distally. But 
is no solid component. This is purely cystic. So in the differential is your IPMN, your serous cyst adenoma, MCN, but the least likely diagnosis would have been pancreatic adenocarcinoma. In this patient with abdominal pain, the least likely diagnosis is, well, I see an infiltrating tumor involving the small bowel. It may be in part exophytic, but it's an impressive lesion. And I'm thinking without even looking at the answers, small bowel adenocarcinoma, it's bulky, so I'm thinking about lymphoma. And I could also think about metastasis. This patient previously had a Merkel cell tumor, and this was metastatic Merkel cell, in fact, a small bowel. But you always got to think about metastasis. Most common would be things like melanoma, perhaps renal cell carcinoma. This does not look like Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is wall thickening, submucosal enhancement, prominent vasorecta. If this patient had Crohn's disease, this would be Crohn's disease with either a carcinoma or lymphoma. So the least likely diagnosis in this case would have been Crohn's disease. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, I see a cystic mass in the body of the pancreas. So quickly, I'm about to say IPMN. Or maybe because of location, I could consider mucinous cystic neoplasm, though that's not even a choice. A serous cyst adenoma, be a small serous cyst adenoma, not a great location. Could be a pseudocyst of the patient had pancreatitis. But then I look at this lesion more carefully particularly appreciated on the coronal views, but also on the axial, if you look very, very carefully, the lesion has a rim enhancement. When I see a cystic lesion in the pancreas with rim enhancement, I'm thinking about a cystic neuroendocrine tumor. And this is a beautiful example of a cystic neuroendocrine tumor. Classically, they may not obstruct the pancreatic duct, may be well-defined, and can be misdiagnosed if you have non-contrast or late venous phase imaging. Cystic neuroendocrine tumors the rim enhancement is best seen on arterial phase imaging. Just a really good case and a real potential pitfall. The best diagnosis in this case is, and I'm giving you an axial images and a 3D cinematic rendering. When you look at the axial image, what catches your eye is you see the left coronary, but then you see the right coronary is intra-arterial. It's between the ascending aorta and main pulmonary artery. It's arising from the left cusp. You can see very nicely that appearance on the 3D cinematic where you can really get a good feel of where the left coronary and the right coronary are coming off the same cusp and their relationship to each other. So the best diagnosis in this case is not normal coronary arteries or at least not normal origin of the coronaries. Uh, it's not coronary artery stenosis. It's not an aberrant origin of the left coronary. The left coronary is fine. This is an anomalous right coronary artery arising off the left cusp, the so-called malignant configurations. The best diagnosis in this case is negative display very nicely. Image on your left, classic bicuspid valve. You can see I'm giving you two sets of images with the valve open and the valve closed. Beautiful example of bicuspid aortic valve. It's not the normal tricuspid. It's not stenosis. There's no leaf thickening. Again, patients with bicuspid aortic valve will get leaf thickening and calcification 10 to 20 years earlier and will invariably need an AVR significantly earlier than a patient with a tricuspid valve. Certain diseases like Marfan's are more common to have bicuspid aortic valves. The least likely diagnosis in this case is, well, what do I see? I see multiple pulmonary nodules, and then I see a mass in the region of the left hilum, which is either coming from the pulmonary artery or growing into the pulmonary artery. So what could I say? Could this be renal cell carcinoma? That'd be a great possibility. Mediastinal nodes, meds to the hilar regions, often growing intravascular and multiple pulmonary nodules. That's a good thought. Hepatoma, same thing, can be very, very extensive, can give you miliary nodules. Lymphoma can give you bulky adenopathy and parenchymal disease as well. The reason I put down least likely is pulmonary artery sarcoma is that this is really a mass growing into the pulmonary artery, not arising from the pulmonary artery. I think that's the key point. Sometimes it can be hard distinguishing 
PE, massive PE from pulmonary artery sarcoma. Sometimes it can be difficult distinguishing a pulmonary artery sarcoma from another malignancy, but in this case, I think we're really thinking about metastatic disease or primary lung cancer. So I think the least likely diagnosis is pulmonary artery sarcoma. The least likely diagnosis in this case is, well, you see a large filling defect in the patient's IVC and the right atrium. It's coming from beneath the diaphragm in all likelihood. And in fact, that's where it came from. So what is this? Well, what is the least likely diagnosis? There's no way this is pseudothrombus. This is the real thing. You want to argue, is it from a renal cell carcinoma, adrenal cell carcinoma, a hepatoma, endometrial stromal sarcoma, which indeed this was. You want to argue that it's a tumor arising in the right atrium growing downward. I feel that's less likely, but that's a thought. But this is not a pseudothrombus. Pseudothrombi are usually flow-related. This is not a pseudothrombus. This is the real thing, the mass effect and in, in fact was an endometrial stromal sarcoma extending up into the IVC recurring after many years. So with that, I've given you 10 terrific cases. I gave you a lot of cases where least likely was the question, so I tried to mix things up a little bit. I hope you enjoyed the quiz cases, hope you learned something, and I hope March is a terrific month for you. And with that, have a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.